This had better be good. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Oh, okay. Okay, well, it's lovely to see so many people in the room. And it's lovely to see so many yellow first timers. So, congratulations and welcome. It's my first time too, but I got a blue one instead of a yellow. I'm not quite sure why. Okay, so social and supported housing. So, um, a little bit about me. I've been working as a housing professional. I'm a chartered member of the Institute of Housing. I've been in housing for about 30 years now. Um, working for local authority in the early days, then um, during LSVT, large-scale tra transfer to the new ALMOs and housing association, ALMO Arms Length Management Organisations, mm. uh, government conservative agenda to um, split off housing. So council housing, early on in the 80s, council housing was split off, basically split off from the rest of the council. So it was a way of getting rid of housing as a debt. They wanted, they wanted housing debt, national housing debt off the books, basically, off the balance sheet. So it was a way of doing that. And that started in the 80s and continues to the present day. So the basic policy hasn't really changed. OK, so we're going to do a little bit of history and background. So what I'm going to give you today is I'm not going to give you anything specialist about supported housing. That's a whole nother topic that I do spend two days on when I'm doing training with Simon, just talking about supported housing in deep context. We will touch on it today, but what I'm hoping to give you, you today is all the strategies that are available in the social housing sector. Everything from sort of rent to rent, flips, buy below market value, all the strategies you get taught in the private sector, they all work adequately well in the social housing sector. It's just using the right language, creating the right contacts, being in the right environment, and you'll be able to open some of these doors to diversify your risk, is what I would, I would say. It's better to have a, a wide... Well, my view is to diversify your risk. But, yeah. So, um, Cathy Come Home in 1966, Ken Roach did a hard-hitting, and if you ever get a chance to see it, I think it's on Netflix, documentary, um, where a family basically ended up being ripped apart. The mother and children had to go one place and the father had to go another. It started that they moved into this lovely new, they came out of the back-to-back -back terraces and they moved into this lovely new high-rise flat with running water and central heating and indoor toilets and all the stuff that, you know, people didn't have. And at that time, there was a, a bit like the Grenfell. There was a swaying consciousness about, you know, this is terrible, we can't split families up, we should be doing more. So homeless legislation started there. So pre-1966, there was no housing law, there was no housing legislation. And I would say I'm probably a specialist in, in homelessness law and housing law. Um, and I've done homeless applications and waiting lists. Birmingham City, just as a, a, a bit of a snapshot, <coughs> they get over 100 applications every day walking to their offices presenting as homeless. So you can see that sometimes the officers get a bit... You know, you don't want to be working at officer level because just, it's just relentless and they get a bit... You have to learn to harden your heart a little bit. So out of this sort of legislation came, you know, councils need to keep a housing list. So who, who was housing? Who were they waiting for? What's their population doing? Um, who is most in need? How do you measure need? How do you say that family over there has got more need than that family? We've got one house. Who do we give it to? How do we allocate it? Help the most vulnerable, so, you know, we have a safety net within our social system, which um, ha has three legs. What are the legs to our, to our welfare system? What are they? You're not all asleep already. <laughs> <laughs> welfare system, what are they? What do we do as a, as a society? NHS. Health, NHS. Education. Education, number two. Social services. Those are the two. The third one, housing. Those are your three legs to the social system. So nobody messes with education and go, yeah, we're going to just privatise it. No, we're going to tax, put a VAT on private education and make it even more difficult to opt out of the system. And nobody wants to mess with NHS, do they? We're all clapping for the NHS. So the only one they mess with, though, we've got this sort of cross between private, a real dynamic cross between private and state, is, is the housing sector. <clears throat> so those are the three sort of legs of the welfare state, and housing's still part of that. Then you've got 
um, local authorities and county councils and who holds statutory duty. Does everybody know when I talk about statutory duty, does everybody know what I mean? No. No. Right, so all your local authorities, all your councils, they all have, from central government, it all filters down and they're given sets of rules that they have to apply, statutory duties, like you know, maintaining the roads, keeping the lights on, emptying the bins, you know, and one of those duties is managing and preventing homelessness. Now, they do not have any legal duty to house a single person. That's not their job. But they do have a duty to try and prevent homelessness. And in preventing homelessness, rehousing people when they are homeless. Okay? This is why we've seen a massive growth in supported housing. Because under their legal definition, they've only got to find you a roof for tonight, and then tomorrow night, and then the next night. They have no legal duty to find you a permanent home. Okay? Is housing list different to that? Housing list, housing list is slightly different to that. The list is about numbers and about who is waiting for housing, you know, and what's their demographic doing. So they do have a duty to maintain the list. They also have a duty that one night, normally in October, um, they either collect data from their charities and other partners or councils go out and do a, do a walkabout. So staff like myself would go out and do a one night walkabout. I think we did it on the 29th of October, and we checked for people in doorways and stuff like that. Now, when I did it, I would be putting down all sorts of people that were awake and chatting to me, and then my boss said, no, they're not asleep, then they're not sleeping, so that's not rough sleeping, so we don't put them down. I was like, talk about massaging your figures. We don't want it to show that we're massively above solid old council or massively, you know, we don't want to get, we don't want our councillors all shouting at us in the meeting, you know, so we, so we, massage the figures like everybody does but yeah that was a bit of a shock to me at the time I was only young and I thought well, that's a bit harsh but this is politics housing is political which I think you've got to as a group of people you need to recognize that and recognize that you're working in a political as well as business environment you'll all come at it from a business point of view but you, if, if you can sort of put your political hat on and think right well, who's going to get the kudos who's going to get the good publicity like whenever I opened, when I was running my supported living business, whenever I opened a scheme, I always do a press release, invite BBC Gloucestershire because I was a non-profit, so I could advertise through BBC Gloucestershire. You know, um, my local MP, my local councillors, you know, they all came and had a walkabout and met the clients and, you know, got big write-up in the press. Because obviously, next time you go to vote, you'll go, oh, that councillor James, he was doing something with young people. Oh, I remember him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll put my vote. You know, so you've got to have that hat on as well. You know, you've got to be political. So I put that out there. HMOs do not meet statutory duty as a permanent housing solution. So under housing law, uh, under housing law, HMOs, if you're sharing with another person that isn't a direct family member, so isn't your husband or wife, your brother or sister or your child, so if you're sharing as a group of friends, or in a HMO, you are entitled to go on that housing list. You might not necessarily get housed, but you're entitled to go on that housing list. So you would, you would have a housing need by definition under the law. It doesn't matter how glorious you make it, screens, videos, swimming pool, doesn't matter. It'd still be considered a housing need. Stems from our background of Rackman in the 1800s where you had you know, families in a room and people cooking on landing. So it's all to do with our roots, where we came from. So we're going to talk about the types of things you can do within the social housing sector, okay? Have some of you seen this before? No, no. no okay, that's good. I have been off the speaker circuit for quite a long time um, because I was due an operation, so I, I'm, yeah, good. I'm glad about that. <laughs> so the top half, increase increased number of people, less number of people, and you know, higher standards, increased regulation. So you obviously, this is working in our sector. This is the private rented sector. So you go to the top, you do, you've got a building, you're changing the client group of that building, okay, to tender to different customers, you know, and so you'll get a different revenue stream. So at the top, you've got your luxury boutique, serviced accommodation. So that could be a flat that you're running serviced accommodation out of it. Uh, high-end HMOs, professional multi-lets, you know, so they are houses that you're changing the client group. 
And then here you've got your general needs buy to let standard, which is what most landlords do. It's the biggest chunk, you know, it's regulated, it's more regulated, it's actually more regulated. The private rented sector is more regulated than the social housing sector now. We had a bonfire under Cameron and who was he co-host with, that Clegg, and they cut up all our regulations. So we're less regulated than the private rented sector now. We're freer to do what we want as housing organisations. Like we could discriminate on welfare grounds. Which you lot can't. Um, so then this is coming into our sector. So you've got care leavers, which is what I ran. I run a care leavers, uh, young persons, HMO, working with social services, doing um, tenancy sustainment, for want of a better word. So teaching young people that have been in the care system. So they've been looked after children. They've been through foster care. They were post 18 and they needed a bit of help to transition to their own flat, basically, their own living, you know which we can talk about a bit later if we've got time. Supported living, learning, disability. So as the needs go up, the money goes up. Yeah, as, as the needs go up, the money go up. And I think, yeah. And then the last one at the bottom there, is this my pointer? Oh, oh dear. <laughs> that one, that one there. So this figure here, where's, my, where's it gone? I can't even. We don't th huh? get on the chair. So this figure here, this figure here, recently in the last report I checked, that's gone up to 24,000 per week per child in some of the London boroughs. Okay? Uh, there's still just a house. There's still just a house, but they're changing the client. So your client is now a vulnerable child. Because under legislation, children's services are ruled by different rules. So they have to house them, they have to find a secure environment. And if there's no landlords that are prepared to do it, what happens? The price goes up. Well, there's no, there's no services. There's actually only one, there's only one national provider that does secure children's homes. And when I say secure, I'm not locking them in at night. Okay, we're not in prison, we're not in Borstal. But what that means is you have people on waking nights that are stopping these kids jumping out of windows, running off and drug dealing and being sex trafficked, which is what's happening to young people in our cities that have been through the care system. I had one guy came to me, he was older, and I was like, oh, he's older, you know, are you sure about that? He was 20. He had been in nine different homes in his five years of secondary education. So he'd not finished a single year of education in the same place. He was 20. He could not read and write. He couldn't even write his own name. That's how poor some of our system is at letting down young people. Sorry, but I'm a bit passionate about it. <laughs> a bit passionate about it. So, the thing about that, it is difficult to do because I've got CQC and Ofsted there. So you've got to be qualified to do care and you've got to be qualified to do education. Now, these people are still looking for properties. The organisation that run children's homes still need a home to run it from. They won't be landlords. They're service providers. They're providing services to local authorities to look after the most vulnerable children in society. They still need property to do that from. So has everybody got that? Yeah. That makes sense? Yeah. Good. Okay. I've got to go the right way now. Okay. So this is something I did with, um, I've been working, I do quite a bit with Simon Zucci and PIN Network, and this is something that Simon helped me with a few years ago, pulling together what the opportunities were, where we thought the value was. If you get a chance to work with any of these sort of people that are leaders of these networking and training organisations, most of them, like Sarge, are very good. You know, they have walk the walk they have done that they have done that they have got there you know so you can buy below market value from the housing sector i've sold properties for a pound i was talking to the lady before we started the deal was an investor came in did the properties up they signed an agreement with us that they would take somebody from the waiting list and that person had the right to stay there that opportunity was for 25 years after 25 years, they could lend open market value and they could let it to anybody they wanted. 
but we had somebody housed from our waiting list that was in high need, so it was a family home, but they did all the work and brought it up to decent home standards, you know. You can deal source and find land opportunities. All good housing associations will want to develop. They're good development partners. You know, they're not going to, in good instances, they'll fund your development. They'll be able to cash flow your deal. So you haven't got a lot of high cost bridge or borrowing to deal with. You can do the lease or let, which is very, very popular. Everybody's talking about the lease or let to supported housing nowadays, just because of lack of homes, I'm afraid. You can JV or become a developer yourself. You can run a social housing business like the likes of Vicky, where is she, or me, who are completely mad to want to do that sort of stuff, because it's not that easy, but you can, you know? Okay, so, okay, so did everybody get that? Does everybody know that? Did you all know that you could do all of those in the social housing sector? So there's a lot of opportunities, and you can mix and match these things up. You can buy below market to one provider who's moving out of a district. I've just been working with, I don't know, how far are we from Staffordshire? I don't know. But I've been working with a provider in Staffordshire that had 75 homes, and they were like, oh, they're too far for us. We don't want to be doing 75 homes. And I've managed to negotiate a deal with a new provider who's coming into Staffordshire. From above, they're going to say, oh, yeah, we'll take all those. I've cut myself into the deal, and I've done a bit of a negotiation where one lot have exited and another lot have bought, but I'm still in the social housing sector, you know. Okay, so you can buy below market properties. Right, so the thing about housing association is they become as motivated as any other landlord especially in big organisations. Once somebody in a senior position has said, we're going to get rid of our care homes, we decided we don't want to get rid of them, the person down the chain goes, oh, A, how quickly can we do that? And another person in the chain goes, that'll give us X number of millions to be able to do new development. So all these other teams within the housing sector are going, we'll be able to do new, let's secure some land, do that. The other team are going, yeah, we need to sell those. So they do become as motivated as anybody. Once it's empty and not generating cash flow, what is it? Liability. Becomes a liability. And we are very, very, like you would, you would say, okay, well, it's growing in capital. Although it's sat there and it might be MB, it's growing in capital. We, don't, we wouldn't account for that. We wouldn't see that as our stock rational for keeping anything. As soon as it's not generating cash in a cash flow, it's then losing us money as far as we're concerned. So then becomes a, you know, a huge liability. Um, they're under no obligation to get best value or market price. So unlike the council, if councils come to sell stuff, and they usually find you put it in auction or it's done through some sort of online auction because they have to have very transparent way of selling stuff. You know, because you can't have Councillor Jones over here talking to Councillor Jenkins over there and they do a little deal, you know. You can't have that for local authorities. So it's, councils are much more transparent. Anything over £500 that they spend, they have to put on their web portal so you can exactly see where they're spending their money. We don't have to do that. Although we're semi-government organised, we've, we've had this bonfire regulations, we can do what the hell we like, basically. So if we choose to sell stuff at a pound, or if we choose to put stuff in auction, then that's up to us. So is there who are the people who can do that? RSL or... Um... RSLs, housing associations, yeah, anything that, anybody that's registered with the housing association. And we tend to sell stock all the time in line with our business plan. Like anybody who's got a lot of properties, you'll be going, is it worth me keeping that? Should we change the mix of that? Can, that, can we extend that? Do I need to remortgage that? You know, what's good to let, what's not to let? Like, especially now with the tax changes, a landlord that's got any sort of volume will be doing this sort of business case. And housing associations are no different to that. They'll be doing that sort of business case. Large organisations have asset disposal officer, and it's fairly easy to get into their little black book. Once you've bought something or you've done a deal with them, anything, they'll come back to you first if you're able to do a deal with them. So quite often you'll find people that buy something from a housing association or RSL, whatever you want to call them. I use housing association, RSL, registered provider, interchangeably, right? We are naturally now registered providers. That's our legal definition under the law. 
go on the website, you can look at registered providers. There's only about 1,600. They're all registered there. We were housing associations, but I would just say a word of caution, because you can be a housing association without being a registered provider. So just make sure that whoever says they're a housing association has got the right credentials and is also an RP, okay? Because you can be a housing association standalone and not have, you know, work under slightly different rules. So yeah, so I do use those interchangeably because most organizations that call themselves still housing associations, I don't know how many do, are also registered providers. But can, and can this provider be a housing association? You can, be, you can set yourself up as a housing association if you apply the, the rules to be a housing association without being a registered provider regulated by the government. It's a bit like being a CIC, community interest company, or a charity. 